afternoon, migrant leaders, mentors. Um, you all know me. Uh, my name is Elham Fardad, and I am the founder and CEO of the charity Migrant Leaders. Welcome this afternoon to what is our second second quarterly mentors webinar really designed as a result of feedback from mentors who wanted even more engagement uh, with migrant leaders uh, and with each other. So we now have quarterly mentors webinars with uh, speakers and training in technical areas and other areas of interest and relevance to migrant leaders work. Um, this afternoon is a particularly special webinar because we have Kate Meredith who is an expert on safeguarding of young people who we have been working very hard with, particularly Fawzia Hart, our head of operations, has been working with Kate very closely, as well as Catherine Grice, who is with us this afternoon as well, working very hard on this afternoon's webinar and training for our migrant leaders mentors in safeguarding our young people who are part of the Migrant Leaders Development Programme. So without further ado, I am delighted to pass uh, the stage to Kate Meredith, who will be training you um, as part of our team this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elham. It's really lovely to be here and it's been a wonderful experience already um, getting to know Migrant Leaders as a charity and getting to know some of the about some of the amazing work that you that you do and that all of you um, all of you mentors do. So it's a really a great privilege to be be with you today. Um, today, as you are probably aware, is the first part of a two webinar piece of training that is specifically around um, safeguarding and applying safeguarding to your role as mentors and really thinking through with you about what um, what it is that you can do in your role as mentors to keep um, young people safe and what to do if you have a concern about a young person that you are working with. We have um, a lot to cover today. We have two hours today and then we have another couple of hours uh, later on in February and I hope that as many of you as possible can uh, can come to both sessions and I hope that you find the sessions really helpful. Um, as I say it's a lot to cover and I wish we had time for um, uh, proper introductions and going around everybody but I just think it would just take so long that actually we're better off just getting going. So I think probably what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my um, my screen with you now if I can see how to do that here we are there will be um, a significant amount of me talking today I am sorry about that it's just because of the amount of um, material that we need to get through but we will make the session as interactive as we can do and certainly in the next session we're going to have even more time for interaction and time spent in breakout rooms and so on and so forth so I hope that um, that it doesn't get too terrible hearing my voice I shall try and and make it as interesting as possible uh, so um, here we are. So um, I hope you can all see that. Please let me know if you can't, but uh, I hope that you can. So this is our introduction to safeguarding. We're looking at the 16 to 25 age group. So it's an age group that crosses over between um, uh, children's legislation and adult legislation, which is one of the particularly interesting and challenging things about um, about uh, what it is that safeguarding means for this age group. Um, so just some introductory things, first of all, I'll just get the slideshow started. So this is fairly standard um, etiquette really in terms of um, Zoom housekeeping. Um, and I'm sure that you're extremely used to it already. If you feel able to keep your cameras on, please do that. Um, if we find that we're struggling with um, an unstable internet or whatever, we may ask people to switch off their cameras, but unless that happens, it would be really lovely if you feel able to keep cameras on. Um, you can mute and unmute yourselves as you want to, um, 
and obviously you have named yourselves on your name tags. Um, also, I recognise that most of you will probably be working from home and actually there are all sorts of things about working from home that can be a little bit complicated. So please don't worry if you need to step away, um, if you need to, or if the dog barks or if anything like that happens, it's all part of um, the thrill of working from home and that's absolutely fine. Um, Please use the, um, the message function, the chat function. Um, it would be great to um, have any questions from you and there will be time for questions at the end. We're going to be using the breakout rooms um, towards the end of the session and we'll give you a one minute warning before the rooms close. But I think you get like a two minute kind of wind down time anyway. So um, yeah, or should all be fairly straightforward really. Um, just a reminder that um, safeguarding, even for people who are dealing with safeguarding all the time, um, can be an emotive and difficult subject, and it can um, it can take us by surprise sometimes. Our own reactions can take us by surprise, even when we're not expecting it. So if you feel that um, that you have been affected or um, you're concerned by any of the issues at all raised in this session, clearly you have a wonderful programme team anyway through Migrant Leaders, and I'm sure that, that Forgy would want to hear from you or Catherine would want to hear from you. But also we have our NSPCC helpline as well that you can use. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. A very simple and straightforward learning agreement. I'm not going to go into it all in detail. Um, it's very straightforward. The only thing that I would point out is around confidentiality. What we always say is if we're running events around safeguarding is that if during the course of the event, we become concerned that somebody, a child or an adult is at risk, then we would want to have discussions with you about how we can take that forward. And we couldn't guarantee to be able to respect confidentiality in those circumstances. But otherwise the learning agreement should be fairly straightforward. Just a quick note about NSPCC and equality and diversity and inclusion. We work really hard and try really hard to work in a way that um, recognises and celebrates diversity and inclusion. And we hope that that is reflected in our training. If you feel that in any way that that doesn't happen and you have any feedback to give us about issues related to equality and diversity and how that is or is not recognized in the training that would be wonderful to hear um, and our training principles um, again I'm not going to go through all of these because you will receive these slides and you can check that um, that actually we've held to our principles but I'm including those in the slide stack so that you can see that they're there so the aim of today's training is really to introduce you to your safeguarding responsibilities as mentors and to help you develop competence and confidence in fulfilling this aspect of your role. And I'm mindful as I'm speaking to you that um, uh, I don't know what your professional backgrounds are and I imagine that certainly um, a number of you will have had safeguarding responsibilities before perhaps. And so I might be speaking to people who are ext already extremely competent and knowledgeable about safeguarding. And so I want to, um, uh, I guess, approach that with some sense of humility. And if you feel that anything that I'm saying to you about safeguarding is um, not correct according to your, um, your knowledge and expertise about that, then please let me know um, because we all need to learn. Um, but this is that is the, the, the overall aim of today's training. Um, as I mentioned before, we have um, two sessions um, in the training, and this is the first session. And we're covering a number of objectives in this session and then a number of different objectives in the next session. So for today, we're going to look at the legislative context of safeguarding, specifically in England. We need to recognise that there are significant differences in the legislative and policy context in different parts of the UK. But it, we, it would just be, we'd be here probably for another two days if we wanted to go through all of those. So we're focusing seeing very much um, on the, the, the English experience and the English situation at the moment. 
if you go on our NSPCC learning website, you will be able to see a lot more about um, how the legislation shifts and changes across different parts of the UK. But we're going to be looking at that legislative context. We're then going to be looking at types of safeguarding concern that apply to young people, including both young adults and young people under the age of 18, and particularly young migrants and how these concerns might be recognised. A lot of the work that we're going to be doing around the recognition of concern will um, be covered in the next session. We're going to do a bit of it today, but please don't worry if you feel that we haven't um, done very much of that because we will have a lot more opportunity to do that. And the same thing applies to the next objective, which is looking about the thing, looking at the things that get in the way for young people who um, might want to disclose or talk about their worries, talk about abuse that they might be experiencing. Um, so again, there are all sorts of things that make it very hard for young people to do that, as we know. And we're going to be looking at some of those today, but equally, we're going to be spending some of the next session thinking about how we can respond effectively to someone who might be at risk. And lastly, um, the last of our four big topics today is really thinking about, about you, you and your mentoring role, how you yourselves can keep safe, can stay safe in that role, and how um, migrant leaders can help you look after your mental health and, um, and other things that you might be concerned about, and how you yourself might be able to contribute to that as well. And then next time, well, we'll deal with we'll deal with session two towards the end of this session. We'll tell you what's in the store for you in session two then. So the program today is um, we're starting with the legislative context in the moment, and um, then we're going to be thinking about um, this particular age group and particular issues for the young people that you might be working with and then we're looking at blocks and barriers and then we're looking at how to stay safe and then at the end we're going to have some final comments and a brief outline of session two and some goodbyes and time for evaluations and so on with a little bit of um, time for questions you'll notice that there isn't any space for a break I apologise for that. Um, it's because of the amount of stuff that we need to cover. But if we do manage to get through it, then I want to try and maybe have a very, very quick comfort break um, around about five o'clock. If we don't manage that, then please do feel free to do whatever you need to do to be comfortable. Or if you need to take a moment away from the session, then please do. But I hope I won't put you in that position because I hope we will be able to even have a very, very short break. So first of all, then, we're looking at um, what is safeguarding, and we're going to summarise what the legislative context um, is around um, safeguarding children and young people in this particular age group. So um, many people use the terms safeguarding and child protection um, interchangeably when they're talking about keeping children, certainly children, safe. But um, in legislation and in statutory guidance, they do not mean the same thing. Um, so I really wanted to clarify that first of all, really. So in terms of safeguarding, when we're talking about children, what we're talking about is a range of different things, really. We're talking about protecting children from maltreatment and preventing the impairment of their health and development. But we're also talking about how to help ensure that children grow up in circumstances consistent with safe and effective care. And also thinking about the action that we can take to enable all children to achieve the best outcomes that they that they can achieve. And so in that sense, all of you as mentors are actually doing safeguarding all the time. Um, it isn't just a special thing that you might do on uh, an occasional basis. It's something that you are doing all the time. And when we talk about child protection, what we're talking about is um, one aspect of safeguarding. So it's the bit of safeguarding that relates to the actions that we take to protect specific children who are suffering or likely to suffer significant harm. So it really only covers, if you look at the first bit of that slide, it really only covers the bit about protecting children from maltreatment and also 
sorry, I've got someone calling me, I've just got rid of it. Um, and also how we can prevent the impairment of children's health and development. So perhaps issues around neglect. So it's about particular children and it's about particular children who might be at risk of, um, of abuse or at risk of neglect. Um, So those definitions are taken from the statutory guidance that, um, that we use in England and in Wales, um, which is called Working Together to Safeguard Children. So if you want the reference for that, that's what it is. So this slide is really just a sort of a visual, um, a visual metaphor for how safeguarding works and how safeguarding and child protection interact with each other. It underlines the fact that safeguarding is a is um is an umbrella term, and that child protection is uh, is one aspect of it. Adult safeguarding is a little bit different. Um, there are many overlaps between safeguarding children and young people and safeguarding adults, uh, particularly as children and young people get older, of course, and as they move more towards um, their more towards adulthood. But in adult safeguarding, there are important differences in emphasis and um, a different legislative framework. So in adult safeguarding, we're very much talking about protecting an adult's right to live in safety, to live free from abuse and to live free from neglect. Um, the emphasis is very much on, um, on human rights here. It's not that it's not on children's rights when we're talking about children's safeguarding, but, but certainly when we're talking about adults, there is very, very much um, uh, an emphasis on, on human rights. And it's really also about people and organizations working together to prevent and stop both the risks of abuse and the experience of abuse and neglect whilst at the same time making sure that the adult's well-being is promoted. And very, very importantly, um, taking the lead from the views and the wishes and the feelings and the beliefs of that adult um, in deciding on, on any action. And importantly, this um, includes recognising that we as adults sometimes have very complex relationships. We may be very ambivalent about some of the choices that are in front of us. We might be unrealistic, we might be unwise about the decisions that we make, but nonetheless, we have the right to make them. And um, really, in most situations, it's not really the place of anybody else to be saying to us, well, I'm sorry, you can't do that. You can't continue to live with that person because that person is bad for you. You, know, you can't continue to drink because drinking is bad for you. Really, we rec the, the adult safeguarding framework recognizes that adults, um, for the huge majority of the time, need to be able to do what, what they decide to do, as long as it's legal. <laughs> um, and as long as it isn't harming other people, that's the other issue, of course. So these points here are taken from the um, I don't know if this is getting in the way for you. It's getting in the way for me a little bit. Um, it's taken from the statutory guidance for the Care Act, which is the major piece of legislation that governs um, adult care. And we'll be talking more about the Care, care Act in a moment. So really to summarize what we're looking at here when we're talking about, certainly talking about adult safeguarding, but also children safeguarding to maybe a slightly lesser extent is, is a very complicated balancing act really it's about managing um it's about managing safeguarding concerns and recognizing the right of a person to be safe from abuse but also at the same time protecting all the other rights that an adult might have and also children have as well in terms of um, making choices and in terms of um, being listened to and in terms of having their wishes and feelings respected. So, so the fulcrum of that um, of the scales can um, shift um, in, in a, into a slightly different place depending on whether we're talking about a child or whether we're talking about an adult or whether we're talking about a young child or whether we're talking about a child who's approaching adulthood. And um, it's, um, yeah, as I say, it's one of those things where, as you might expect, it's not simple, it's quite complicated. And um, it's something where professional judgment and um, humanity and compassion all need to come together to, uh, to play a part in the way in which we 
do what we can to try and keep people safe. If we're thinking about the, man the mandate to safeguard and who it is and what it is that tells us that we have a responsibility to safeguard, then that is very clearly set out in statutory guidance, both for adults and for children. So in terms of children, if we look again at the statutory guidance working together, um, Working Together is regularly updated and it's actually due for an update at the moment, but the current edition is the 2018 edition. But if we look at that, we can see that it says really clearly that every organisation, whether that's a big statutory organisation like social services or the police, or whether it's a small charity um, or a medium sized charity or a private sector organisation, all of those organisations need to have policies in place to safeguard and protect children from harm. And that everyone who's involved with those organizations, volunteers, employees, everybody really, trustees, need to be following those policies and those procedures in order to um, make sure that they are complying with what is required. And in terms of adults, um, again, the guidance on the CARE Act that we've mentioned already really says very clearly that in order to respond appropriately where abuse or neglect may be taking place, anybody in contact with the adult, whether that is someone who's paid or whether it's a volunteer person, must understand their own role and responsibility and have access to advice and support and guidance on what it is that they should be doing. And this would include understanding what their own organisations policies and procedures are, but also local interagency policies and procedures. So a very clear mandate there really that, um, that we can't get away from. If we look at the, the framework for child protection um, as a sort of series of layers, we can think of it as, um, as, as layers that really should all be um, consistent with each other and should all fit together. Um, so if we start at the very top there with the primary legislation, um, those are in terms of um, child protection, in terms of children safeguarding, those are the two children acts, the 1989 act and the 2004 act. Um, we'll talk about them in a moment. Um, and th th those are the things that really, um, I suppose, set the framework. But then um, underneath that and flowing from that, we have the statutory guidance that the government issues. So that is the working together guidance that we've already referred to um, in relation to child protection. And then sitting underneath that, we have national professional standards. So people in, in roles such as, um, I don't know, teaching or social work or um, youth work or the police or the law, all those different things really, they all have um, professional standards that they have to adhere to. And because all those professions involve working um, with young people in certain circumstances, they, they will all include standards around safeguarding. So that is another thing that needs to make sure that it sits within um, government guidance and legislation. And then we have, um, local partner arrangements. So those are um, what we used to call local safeguarding boards, but that terminology has now changed. We now call them safeguarding partnerships. Um, and they are run on a regional basis, as you may be aware. And there are um, certain partners who have to be included, like um, local, local, the local authority and um, the police and health, but then also there can be other partners who are invited on into a partnership by a particular, um, by a particular board. And then underneath that, we have each organization's own policy and, and its own procedures. And within Migrant Leaders, you have a really, really excellent um, policy and excellent procedures. So that's, a great thing to see really because it just makes things so much easier and so much better for everybody who's trying to follow them. Just to say a little bit more about these two um, seminal um, pieces of legislation in relation to children safeguarding. So the Children Act 1989 is the act that um, allocates the duty of care to local authorities and the courts and parents and, and other agencies to ensure that children are protected and their welfare is promoted. So it was a, a very, very much a groundbreaking act, a really beautiful and 
elegant piece of legislation that that has some has really stood the test of time. And then also we have the other children at the 2004 Act and the emphasis within the 2004 Act is very much around um, the coordination and information sharing protocols that should be existing between different agencies to improve the overall well-being of children. In terms of the principles of both of those acts, um, we need to just stress that um, the there's what we call the paramountcy principle. Um, the welfare of children is paramount. So that in all the decisions that are made, all the legal decisions that are made, and all the decisions that different agencies should be making themselves, the, the thing that should remain at the very center of that decision is the welfare of the child. Not what parents want to do, um, not what schools want to do, not what makes things more comfortable for everybody, not even what the child wants. It's what um, is seen as being um, in the best interests of the child. It's the welfare of the child. And the acts recognize that children in, um, in all but exceptional cases are best looked after within their families, um, unless compulsory intervention in family life is necessary. So there's very, very much the emphasis that, um, that, that family life is the place um, for children, parents, the people who should be looking after children, not local authorities, and um, that unless there's absolutely overwhelming evidence to the contrary, that is something that should be happening. And if parents need support in doing that, that's what we do. We support parents to do that. We don't say, sorry, you're bad parents, taking children away. That is how it should be. I wanted to say something about um, abuse of a position of trust. Position of trust is um, a, a legal concept. Um, at least that's how we're using it in this context. And it's quite a complicated legal concept, really. And I wanted to cover it because of its relevance to yourselves as mentors. And I'm just checking the time. I think we're all right for the moment. Um, so um, a, position, a position of trust is... Um, it covers certain roles and settings where an adult has regular and direct contact with children. And under the Sexual Offences Act, the 2003 Sexual Offences Act, it's an offence for somebody who is in a position of trust to engage in sexual activity with a child in their care, even if that child is over the age of consent. So, even, even a young person who is 16 and therefore in normal circumstances able to consent to a sexual relationship or um, sexual acts, um, that does not apply if the relationship between that young person and the person who they are sexually involved with is, um, is that of, of um, the child being in the care of or being under the supervision of the person who um, who they're, who, who they're having sex with. Um, and if that happens, then, then that, that, is, that is a criminal offence. The thing that's complicated is that the position of trust doesn't apply in, um, in all situations where um, an adult um, has a child in their care. It, it only, under the law, it only applies to a certain number of professions. And those professions include teachers, care workers, youth justice workers, social workers, and doctors, and yeah, and foster carers. It's some, it's a very limited number. And one of the concerns that has been around for a long time, including within the NSPCC, is actually that definition of what a position of trust is under the Sexual Offences Act should be broadened. And that is very shortly going to be happening. And there's an amendment that is going to be um, applied to the Sexual Offences Act. And the vehicle um, for the amendment is a bill that's, it's just this enormous bill that is going through Parliament at the moment. It's got to the House of Lords stage at the moment, and it's nearly at the end of the House of Lords stage. I think it's up to the third reading now, and then it'll pass on to the final stages. But when um, that police crime sentencing and courts bill is passed, then the Sexual Offences Act will at the same time be amended and the position of trust will be extended to include situations where the adult in question is um, instructing a young person in the sport or in a faith context. Um, it still doesn't apply at the moment to 
to other roles where adults might be involved with young people between the ages of 16 and 18. Um, it still at the moment only applies to what it applies to already, plus those two additions. But I, what what th there is a view that actually this is um, a start of um, a continuing process, perhaps where the position of trust definition will be extended more and more. And it's not um, it's um, it's it's quite likely, I imagine, that that before very long it might also apply to a role such as a mentorship role. So clearly, it is a a, a thing that that. Um, that mentors need to be extremely aware of and although at the moment it isn't technically a criminal offence for a mentor to be involved sexually with a young person in their care between the age of 16 and 18 it clearly is in breach of um of the code of conduct that that migrant leaders have it's clearly in breach of what we would all understand to be um good practice and so it is something that actually we need to be taking a lot of notice of already. So that bottom point there really is even if an organisation does not have the above names but specified roles the principles of the position of trust should still apply and included within a code of conduct. Um, penalties if people are found um, to be in a uh, in breach of their position of trust, um, legal penalties can uh, be up to five years in prison. So significant, um, a significant sentence really, if, uh, if that is what happens. Oh no, what's happened here? I don't quite know how this has happened. Here we are. So, if we look at the National Framework for Adult Safeguarding, we've been talking about the National Framework for Children's Safeguarding up to now, but if we look at the Framework for Adult Safeguarding, then there are six key principles that we need to be thinking about. These are the six key principles, and they have specific meanings within the statutory guidance. So it's worth checking out what these um, what the specific meanings are within the guidance. So um, empowerment, for example, the meaning of empowerment within the Care Act statutory guidance is helping the adult to make their own decisions and to give informed consent, rather than saying, oh, that person, that you know, they, they've, they've got a learning disability, They're, they can't decide what they want to do about this or that or the other, we need to decide for them. It's actually operating from the assumption that a person can make decisions about their own future, an adult can make decisions about that they need to be making about their lives and that actually what we should be doing rather than making decisions for them is wherever at all possible um, helping them and supporting them in making the decision for themselves. And equally there are um, there are specific um, meanings for each of those key principles. So proportionality, for example, this one at the bottom here, that is about um, using the least intrusive um, response appropriate to the risk presented. So, um, okay, it might be that actually we are in a situation where the person um, doesn't have the capacity um, to be able to make a decision for themselves. But let's have a think about what might be the least intrusive thing, the thing that interferes least with that person's life, um, that actually makes sure that, that they're safe and make sure that we deal with the risk. Um, yeah, most of the other key principles are, well, they speak for themselves really, so I'm not going to go into massive um, detail about them because, um, because of time, I guess. If we think about, um, an adult safeguarding situation. What um, with if we're thinking about safe, safeguarding adults generally, what we're mainly talking about is what we now call adults at risk, previously referred to as vulnerable adults. Um, and the reason that terminology has changed really is to recognise that um, that any of us at some time in our lives will go through periods where we ourselves are vulnerable. Vulnerable people are not people who are born vulnerable and stay vulnerable all their lives. In most circumstances, people go through situations where they are less vulnerable or more vulnerable and all of us can be in that position. So if we talk about adults at risk, that um, is seen as being something that helps to, um, helps to capture that idea better. 
So when the local authority is deciding whether it's going to um, whether it's going to have a statutory safeguarding intervention in respect of an adult, um, there is a, a, a sort of a three point test that it has to apply. So it has to, first of all, um, come to a view that the adult is someone who has care and support needs. And those care and support needs could be, oh, all sorts of different things really. It could be, if we're, if we're talking about um, someone who is, um, who is, elderly and who is struggling to manage at home then there could be care and support needs in relation to that if we're talking about someone who has an addiction it could be about care and support needs in relation to that if we're talking about um a young parent who's perhaps struggling with um a child who might have a disability then that person all has care also has care and support needs so there's a quite a wide way in which that can be applied that idea um but so so we've got an adult who has care and support needs and that person is also at risk of abuse and neglect and the third bit of the test is that the person can't keep themselves safe and the reason why they can't keep themselves safe is the nature of their care and support needs. So it's quite a complicated three-point test really. And, um, and that is because of the legislative emphasis on self-determination. Um, all this that we've been talking about already about the emphasis on adult rights and people being able to make their own decisions and so on and so forth. But what it doesn't mean is that um, if someone doesn't um, satisfy that three-point test that actually we you know no, nothing is provided for them and no support is offered to them at all um it's what, what it means is that actually the support then might come from a different source or it might be about um thinking about how we can um signpost that person to to different uh, to 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 the help that they need or work with them to um to to try and um reduce any risk that they might be at um and in terms of different types of abuse that exist within within um the care act that are described within the care act there are 10 types of abuse these are the different types of abuse that are described but one of the things that the care act makes really clear is that that is not an exhaustive list this is different from um children's legislation where we've got four um very clear categories of abuse um and well three category abuse and one category of neglect here we're talking about something that um is um yeah is much more recognizing some of the additional um, risks and the additional um, potential vulnerabilities that we might all be exposed to um, during our lives. And as I say, it's not um, seen as being an, an exhaustive list. It's very much seen as these are the most common um, examples that are listed in the legislation, but there might be other ways in which that person might be being abused that aren't comfortably covered by those definitions and that we should be thinking about what the experience of that person is really rather than trying to fit them into one of those particular types. We've talked um, a little bit about um, capacity and I've, um, I've referred a little bit to mental capacity and I wanted to say a little bit more about that. Um, because the piece of legislation that deals with mental capacity is the Mental Capacity Act 2005, which again is an extremely important bit of legislation when we're thinking about adult safeguarding. Um, I quite like this image because, and I quite like the use of the hand because it helps us remember what the five principles of the Mental Capacity Act um, are. So I'll just run through those quickly because again, it helps um, to, I suppose, helps to get our heads around what the um what the basic um concepts and values and assumptions are around adult safeguarding so the first principle is a presumption of capacity we start by thinking that a person can make a decision um, we then think about okay well if the person is struggling to make a decision it's how we can support them to do so and when we're talking about making a decision we're not talking about someone who can't decide whether they want to have um i don't know chicken for tea or they want to have fish for tea it's about obviously it's about a major decision affecting their their life and, and them not having the um 
the the, the mental um, functionality to be able to make that decision. So, so the second principle is about individuals being supported to make their own decision and us helping them to do that. The third principle, which we've already mentioned, is about um, we can't say that a person lacks capacity to make a decision just because the decision seems to us to be unwise. And then if we move into a situation where um, there's a professional assessment that a person does not have the mental capacity to be able to make a specific decision at a specific time, then, then the act would say that um, that someone making a decision on their behalf has to um, make a decision in that person's best interest and that the decision that they make has to be the least restrictive option um, and doesn't restrict the person's freedom or interfere with the person's life more than is needed in order to deal with the risk or the concern that some, that's, that's causing the problem. So those are the principles of the Mental Capacity Act. And again, as you can see, they sit very comfortably with all the things that we've been talking about in relation to the Care Act and the, the principles of the Care Act and the Care Act statutory guidance. I'm aware of the time and we really need to, I really need to be moving on. What I wanted to do really is just, um, I don't want to, we, we haven't got time, unfortunately, to talk a lot about um, these scenarios, but I just wanted to offer some examples to um, to put some con some flesh to the um, ideas that we've been talking about and the idea of that um, the um, the balancing act and the fulcrum shifting according to the age of the person um, and the situation of the person. So the first situation that we've got here is we have an eight year old girl telling her teacher that she's being sexually abused by her 15 year old cousin and she doesn't want anyone else to know. I think most of us would agree that in that situation, we're not able to respect that child's wishes for nobody else to know. People do need to know and that situation needs to be dealt with. Um, but if we move to um, a different scenario, say the third one on that sheet, on that uh, screen there, if we, if we have Khadija who's 20, she's telling her driving instructor that her boyfriend is using coercive control towards her, but she doesn't want anything doing about it, then we might reasonably say, well, this is a young adult, um, she is okay, she's, she's in an abusive relationship, but actually she's being really clear that she recognizes that that is the fact, but at the moment she doesn't want anything doing about it. So as you can see, just very simple examples really to help us think about, um, about how, that, uh, how that fulcrum might shift when we're trying to balance a person's um, wishes and feelings against the person's um, uh, rights and needs for protection. So the next section that we want to look at now is about um, why is safeguarding relevant for the 16 to 25 age group and for young people who might be first or second generation migrants. So um, what we do need to be thinking about here is what are some of the things that can make older teens and young adults vulnerable? And you have a very, very comprehensive list of these things in um, your safeguarding policy and procedure, which you might be aware of already. I'm sure that you are. Um, and so these are these are really just a few, um, which could apply to um, to a whole host of young people. And uh, I'm not going to go through them all in detail again because, as I say, you have a, you have a very comprehensive list of them already. Um, but one of the things that we do know about, if we if if we then start thinking about the young people that you work with as mentors is that unfortunately there might be um, a, a risk that those young people um, are encountering even more um, issues that could make them vulnerable than the other uh, than other um, other young people might be encountering. So, for example, they're more likely to face discrimination based on ethnicity or culture or faith. They're more likely to be encountering language issues and issues regarding their adjustment to living in the UK. Um, so, those things are additional things that we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about the um, the. The group of young people that uh, that you yourselves are working with, and when we were thinking about this, some um, this 
uh, presentation and this webinar, we were thinking about also some of the key theoretical concepts and models around safeguarding that can be particularly helpful and particularly relevant to when we're working with young migrants. And the three that we wanted to look at in a slightly more detail um, are firstly um, the uh, approach that we know that is known as contextual safeguarding. Secondly, trauma-informed practice. And thirdly, the concept of intersectionality. And I'm sure that many of you will be very familiar with some, if not all, of these concepts. But because some people might not be, um, I really wanted to um, explore them just a little bit further with you because they can really help to enhance our understanding of the complexity of the safeguarding issues that can affect um, young people from migrant communities. So if we look first of all at contextual safeguarding, um, many of you, as I say, might be aware of this. It's um, a phrase that was originally coined by Colleen Fermin um, some years ago. So uh, Colleen Fermin is, um, is a professor at the University of Bedfordshire and um, has, has, together with colleagues, has developed the contextual, contextual safeguarding network, which has become extremely influential um, in uh, the world of safeguarding over recent years. Um, and contextual safeguarding, as it says here, is an approach to understanding and responding to young people's experience of significant harm beyond their families. And it, it recognizes that as, um, as children grow, they spend an increasing amount of time away from from um, the bosom of their families and um, in a range of different environments. Um, and they might be online environments or um, they might be sort of physical environments such as school, college, um, time with their peers, whatever it is that they're, that they're doing. And unfortunately, we know that, um, that those environments can, in some situations, expose the young person to risk and that there's also a dynamic that exists between the environment and the young person in that environment. The young person is not a passive um, a passive person in that environment. Young people have to survive and they have to thrive in all the different environments where they spend time. And so they have to interact with the environment in order to do that. And that can then um, put them in a situation where they are um, getting into relationships or having to adopt behaviours that can actually place them at further risk. Um, so it's a kind of complex situation, really. So um, what the contextual safeguarding network says and what the approach says is that um, if we are um, working with older young people and young people who are um, spending a lot of time in different, in different environments, then there are great benefits in um, targeting support, not just at individual young people, but also um, at the environment itself. So if we have an environment that is um, that has become an unsafe environment for young people, maybe it's um, a public space, maybe it's a school, maybe it's a college, um, whatever it is, maybe it's an online environment, then what um, can be a really effective thing is to try and, um, I suppose, disrupt the um, conditions that are causing um, that to be an abusive environment in the first place. So what can be done to kind of um, reclaim that environment so that it then becomes a safer place for young people to be spending time? And in order to do that, um, there might be all sorts of um, things that can be done, both in terms of thinking about how to um, incorporate contexts, extra familial contexts into the frameworks that we operate when we're talking about child protection, and also in terms of the partnerships that we develop. So within lots of um, pieces of work that have gone on around contextual safeguarding, there have been partnerships with um, sectors and with individuals who perhaps haven't traditionally been um, part of the safeguarding agenda at all, but who can really make an influence, they can make it make a difference, they can notice things, and they can report things, and they can have um, um, conversations and helpful interactions with young people. So for example, um, we might be talking about um, security staff in a shopping mall, we might be talking about um, um, taxi firms might be talking about um, hotels where perhaps young people are taken for the purposes of sexual exploitation. These are partnerships 
that can really help to try and, um, as we've said, um, stop abuse from happening in those situations and make those safer environments for young people. And it also means that when we're um, monitoring um, outcomes for success in relation to um, making young people safer, that we're looking at um, contextual change, measuring contextual change, as well as measuring individual change. So again, um, this is something that it's really helpful to think about if we're thinking about young migrants, because um, we know, as we've said, that young migrants can sometimes be at additional risk of, um, of horrible things like um, human trafficking or sexual exploitation or all of those things. And if we're aware of this as a, as a way of thinking about safeguarding, it can help us to, um, to I suppose, notice um, signs and symptoms of that that might, that might be happening with the young person that we're working with. Another um, area of um, theory that is really interesting to look at in relation to young people from migrant backgrounds is um, around trauma-informed practice. Um, so there are many different um, contributions to social care practice that take account of a young person's experience of trauma. And this term, um, ACE, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, is a term that's commonly used to describe a set of experiences that have the potential to cause lasting difficulties for a young person right throughout their lives, really, um, in terms of their physical and mental health, in terms of their social and emotional development, um, and in terms of their, of their ability to achieve um, their potential and to achieve um, personal happiness in their in their lives as adults. So it's important, really, that we are that we are aware of those. Um, and there are nine um, core experiences that have been. Um, highlighted through research and um, and through studies that have uh, that have taken place, and the nine experiences are are these ones that are listed here on the coloured bars in this slide. Um, and what um, we know is that many of us might have suffered perhaps one or two of these experiences, but that if um, the people who've suffered four is is one of the kind of is the kind of key number really anyone who has suffered more than four of these experiences as a child as a young person growing up um the risk to that that person of um suffering very long term um consequences and 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 harm as a result of those experiences then increases ex exponentially um but what we also know is that um it's not inevitable that um, adverse childhood experiences have to happen to children. And it's not inevitable that even if they do happen, um, it has to always result in, um, in serious harm happening to that person throughout their lives. And what we know is that there are things that we can do both to prevent adverse childhood experiences happening in the first place, but also, and here critically for mentors, we can be thinking about the role that we can have in, um, in helping the young person to build and develop their resilience to the impact of trauma. So, okay, the young person that we're working with might have experienced um, very difficult things in their lives, but um, there are things that we can do to try to mitigate the impact of those experiences. So these are some of the things really that we know can help a young person to build resilience, even if they have already um, suffered trauma. So one or more stable, caring child adult relationships, clearly as a mentor, um, you are in a position of um, having such a relationship, maybe not in the same way, obviously, that, that, that a parent would have, or perhaps even that um, a teacher might have. But nonetheless, when we hear people talk about the value that they have derived from mentorship experiences, we really know that that can have a real impact on a young person's life in terms of giving them that stability, in terms of um, really giving them that um, encouragement um, around what they can what they can go on to achieve. 
We also know that anything that we can do to help a young person understand and um, manage their behaviour and emotions can also be an incredibly helpful thing. Um, and again, that is something that can be part of a mentorship relationship as well. Um, recognising that a person, a young person who has had traumatic experiences might be more prone to particular types of behaviour, might be more prone to particular types of difficulties. But if we can help them to develop awareness about that and what they can then do and the help that they can then get to help them manage their behaviour and their emotions better, then again, we can help to mitigate those um, the, the, the potential damage that can be caused by that. A third thing that we know is, helps to build resilience is um, a young person being involved and connected in something that they enjoy. And again, this is a this is a really important and uh, helpful thing to know as a mentor because hopefully what mentors are doing is that they are providing a young person with something that they can be connected with, something that they can enjoy, something that really gives them um, confidence and makes them feel that they are worthwhile and that they can do something well. Um, these are all really, really important and valuable things. And also helping the young person understand that they're not alone, that there is support there um, from all sorts of sources to help them overcome hardship. And again, that terrible sense of um, isolation that a lot of people, including adult survivors, talk about when they talk about their childhood experiences of abuse, that terrible, terrible isolation. If we can help young people to, um, to, to believe that actually they're, they're not they're not alone that there are people there who care and there are people there who can support them then that can help to diminish um that um that terrible thing really around that isolation that they might experience intersectionality this is the last of the um of the um concepts that we want to look at and I'll try and deal with this quite quickly um so intersectionality again is um a concept that I'm sure many of you will be very familiar with. It's been around since the late 80s and was first developed by Kimberly Crenshaw, um, and I think first applied to feminist thinking, but has since been, um, um, I suppose, seemed to be a very helpful concept um, in relation to all sorts of other ways of thinking about different forms of oppression and different forms of discrimination or disadvantage. And um, at core, it's, it really says that, that all, all different types of discrimination and oppression are linked and can overlap with each other and um, can be contingent upon each other and can be um, interdependent and create whole systems of discrimination or disadvantage. And that actually each of us has, um, has our own um, unique um, footprint in terms of um, how our own experiences, including our experiences of discrimination and oppression, how, how, they, how that has um, affected our, our, our lives and, and, um, and, and our, our sense of identity, really. Um, this, this diagram here shows some of the areas of identity or some of the areas of social categorization that, um, that we can pick out just a few of them. There are many more. I mean, there are that we have that that, does, that that diagram there doesn't include things like economic status or education or whether you're in a relationship or not or um, anything like that. Re really, um, what your what your professional um, experience might be. There are all sorts of things, and what what might be, um, and if we have more time, what would be a really interesting thing to do is to offer you the opportunity to maybe start to build your own your own map, really, and look at your, at your own experiences or where you perhaps feel that you might have, um, have experienced elements of exclusion or elements perhaps of discrimination or or of, of oppression and how those things have um, have overlapped with each other. Um, uh, so yeah, we haven't got time to do that now, but, but again, it's something that we need to think about in relation to the young people that we're working with, because they will be young people who perhaps have, um, who almost certainly 
are going to be experiencing um, or will have experienced um, discrimination or will have experienced exclusion in different areas of their lives and where those um, the different ways in which um, those things might be overlapping um, in terms of the, the various aspects of their identity. So what we're going to do for about the next 20 minutes probably is to have a think about the blocks and barriers um, that young people face when they're thinking about sharing their worries. And of course, um, of course, what we know is that there, there are many barriers to um, for young people in getting help. And it's very difficult for any young person who is being abused to talk about their worries and to um, get help um, to deal with them. But there can be um, additional barriers that can be to do with um, perhaps the child's vulnerability in terms of um, their individual characteristics or the circumstances that uh, that they have to live with um, and those are some of the things that we've been talking about already um, for example the situations of disadvantage or or possibly a disability or something like that that can make it very difficult um, for a child even more difficult for a child than that than for for, for that child than for another child. Also, there can be a whole set of barriers that can be put in place by um, a perpetrator as part of the grooming process. And here's a little bit of intersectionality because we know that um, perpetrators often um, home in on children whom they identify as already being vulnerable and easier to groom or easier to isolate. Um, so those two things kind of fit together a bit really in a rather horrible way in some cases, although any child can be abused, we can't just assume it's children who were already vulnerable in a different way. Um, but yes, lots of barriers that perpetrators themselves can put in place as part of um, uh, the grooming that they, um, that they that they use in order to be able to abuse a child. And also, um, and these are things that we need to think about really carefully, there can be barriers that can be unintentionally created by an environment that could otherwise help to protect a child. So um, a school, for example, a school could, um, one would hope that a school or um, a college could be a place where a child or a young person would be able to speak to somebody about their worries, but, you can have a school that actually does things that makes that um, easier for a child, and you can have a school that does that doesn't do things that makes it easier. Where a child, perhaps, um, it, for all sorts of different reasons, it's difficult for that to happen. So, what we want to do ultimately is to make sure that um, Migrant Leaders is and remains um, an organisation where um, there are factors in place that support a child talking about their worries, rather than creating extra barriers, if you see what I mean. So um, what we really want to do here, and I, don't, I, I, I hope that you're able to do this really, is um, to think about what some of those barriers might be. And I don't know if any of you have used the annotate function before. Um, I don't know if you've, if you've done that, but if you, if you have, then um, you can uh, click the little annotate button. It looks like a little pencil. Um, on your screen and that will then enable you to then click text and you can you can write in what um what you think some of the barriers might be so for example this is me writing one in here so um a barrier might be um that a child has a disability and it would also it would also be a a break from me talking which i'm sure most of you would be relieved to to see Sorry, Kate, with that interruption in the recording, I was trying to find the annotate function, but I can't find it, I'm afraid. Oh, can't you? Um, if you can, can you see, um, there's like a menu, sort of a black bar. If you, if you see this black bar that you can, oh, yeah, can yes, you see I this found black it. Bar so in the view options yeah? at yeah. the top of the screen. Yeah. yeah. And then if you click text um, and then a little, it will create a little text box on the, on the screen and then you can write in whatever you want to write in. Yeah, okay. that's it. So, so Paul has just written in peer group as um as one of the barriers, which absolutely is uh can be one of the barriers um for a young person. I'll just um, give you a couple of minutes to do that because I can see that various people are um are 
thinking about what they're going to put. Yeah, that's some interesting, yeah, um, about how a young person speaks can, can, that, that, can, that can be a barrier as well. Um, access to technology, yeah, again, we know that that can be sometimes related to um, economic deprivation as well, that we can't assume that all young people have access to technology. Yeah, family relationships, yeah. Yeah, the young person's isolation. Yeah, thank you. Um, lack of confidence. What you need to do um, before you actually type something in is you need to click the little T for text on the same bar as the annotate thing. Um, and that will um, enable you to type it in their yeah, language. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, some really, really helpful um, comments here, particularly comments that might be related to the young people that you're working with. Um, so a lack of cultural understanding, um, yeah, the young person's language ability, um, yeah, all these things, yeah. Um, can you think of anything that perhaps a perpetrator might do in order to put barriers in the way of a young person being able to talk about their worries? Part of that grooming process, can you think of any aspects of the grooming process that might um, create barriers? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Some comments here that that, yeah, perpetrators are really good at threatening, helping young person feel threatened. Um, yeah. Threatening them or threatening their loved ones. Um, yeah. Yeah. Perpetrators are good at um, getting young people to trust them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely and that someone else has put threats there so threats can certainly be part of that yeah the, the um Catherine there has put isolating them so we know that perpetrators can um deliberately work to isolate young people and for someone else has put here cut them off from friends and the support network yep creating dependency and giving them gifts yeah again really all all very um very much part of the grooming process yeah the controlling is a way of some of summing it up I think isn't it all those things that can um control a young person and, and give the perpetrator control over the young person so that they feel that they can um abuse them with impunity really yeah taking the phone off them yeah yeah financial control yeah, absolutely. If you now think about maybe some of the things that might make it hard for a young person, perhaps who wants to tell a person who works with them, an adult who works with them, say a mentor or a teacher, they would like to tell that person um, that they're worried about something, but what might be happening in the environment or what might be happening within the place where the teacher or the mentor is or anything like that that makes it hard for the young person to do that sort of unintentional barriers that an organization or, or even we as individual mentors or people working with young people can put in place can you think of any of those yeah 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 too busy yeah for just I said too busy absolutely it's easy to get very busy isn't it and what we know is that young people well, when it when it happens to me, it's often sort of at the end of things, you know, where you're clearing up and a young person might um, hang, be hanging about and you're thinking, oh, you know, I need to get back. I've got to get dinner on or whatever. And you can see that a young person needs to talk and you think, oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else that um, you might might be going on that would make it hard for um, a mentor or a teacher or or an organisation to um help a young person say if they're worried yeah okay we'll leave it there thanks so much everyone for um for doing that that's um really helpful i have to get rid of all these um these things now um so that i can move the um <laughs> move the slide on so i have to rub out all that work i'm sorry about that yeah um and then yeah and then hopefully oh go away eraser no okay so here we have our young person it's actually this has gone on a bit um too far no it's not here we have our young person and um this young person is facing all sorts of barriers the barriers that we've already been talking about really 
I want you to watch what's happening to the person as I'm actually um, putting all these barriers up, all these bricks in the wall. These are some, these, these are, I suppose, some of the things that you've already identified, maybe one or two others, maybe some that you haven't, maybe there are some that you did identify that aren't up here already. But um, one of the things that is, is significant is that the more barriers there are that get in the way of a young person being able to talk about their worries, the more invisible that young person becomes. So this young person on this slide now, we can, can't really see them at all, all we can see are the barriers really. And that is something that can happen in a really um, insidious kind of a way because um, the busier you are, um, the, 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 the harder it is for that young person to um, make themselves um, known to you, um, to talk to you, then um, the more invisible they become. So they become more and more trapped basically. Um, yeah, so a tricky, very hard situation really. So. The, the thing for us, really, the task for us is how to be a door, really, rather than another brick in the wall. Um, how we can be um, not, not necessarily the, the person who makes everything right for the young person, but the person who can act as a portal, act as a means through which the young person can pass through all those barriers. We can't make the barriers go away, but can we be um, some um, mechanism, some agent through which the young person can, um, can pass through the barriers in order to be able to get help, in order to be able to tell somebody what's happening for them and in order to be able to um, move on with their lives. So, what we'd like now really is, um, this is where the breakout rooms come in. What I'd really like you to um, focus on in breakout rooms for the next 10 minutes is um, what are the things that mentors can do in their role with young people to help overcome or dismantle the barriers to those young people getting help if they're facing abuse? Most of them, the vast majority of them won't be facing abuse, but they might have other worries that they want to talk about and a very small number of them might be facing abuse. So what can we do? What can we all do in our work with young people to help them to overcome um, those barriers? So you might want to think about um, the issues that might either support or get in the way of mentors being able to listen to mentees if they want to talk about their worries. Um, how migrant leaders as an organization can help or hinder through its organizational culture and systems and structures and also the messages that um, that we as a, that we as mentors, that you as mentors, or that the organisation itself can send to children about being safe and about getting help. That kind of positive, those positive messages that actually we can be be sending out to children to help them to feel that it's okay for them to talk about their worries. So, um, so Fuja, are you going to create the breakout rooms now? I am. How long would you like them to last for, Kate? Well, it's 5.23 now. So um, I think that if we, I think we, people need a bit of a decent time to talk, don't they? So I think if we say, um, if we say eight minutes, should we say eight minutes? So people come back at half past. Okay. I'll set um, it to close automatically after eight minutes. Yeah. That would be great. And what I'd want you to come back with, um, back from your group, we're not going to have time for a lot of feedback, but we need one little, we need a little bit of feedback. So if you can think of one really key point, one thing that your group has come up with as a key point that, that either can be a point that an individual mentor could do or something that migrant leaders as an organisation could do to help young people overcome barriers to getting help if they're facing abuse. Um, just one really important thing that you would like to be able to tell the rest of the group, if you can just come back with that and, and nominate someone in your group who can do that for you, that would be lovely. Okay, so I'll let you do that now. Okay, I'm going to open. That's lovely. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for that. I'm sorry we didn't have longer in those groups. Certainly in, in my group, we had um, some really fascinating discussion 
Um, Fortia, do you know who was in the different groups? And would you like to um, um, invite each group to give their bit of feedback? I can't remember everybody that was in each group. I joined Yvonne's group, so perhaps I could invite Yvonne first, if that's all right with you, Yvonne. And then um, please volunteer from your other groups if you don't mind. So Yvonne was group four. Yeah, she was. Yeah. So um, yeah. So um, so Yvonne, are you um, are you willing to share your um your learning point from from group four? Yeah, I think um, so for us from group four, uh, we we agreed that it would be best when we thought about what could we as mentors do. Um, we didn't really discuss much what could migrant leaders do, although uh, in the last 20 seconds, I had a little thought. But for what we as mentors could do, we thought that it was important that we create, we make the young person comfortable. So we create that sense of uh, safe space um, to, so they could feel that we really are listening without judgment. Mm. And we'd be patient, be comfortable with the silence. Don't try and fill the silence because... If they have something to disclose, they may be feeling shame. They may not be looking for the words, et cetera. Mm. So if we could be comfortable with that and not rush them um, mm. and let them know that, you know, you know that it's, it's okay to share whatever they want, mm. we, they want, they want to share, share with us. Um, mm. uh, we did also, I, I thinking about what could migrant leaders do? Oh, well, the other thing we thought about is not insisting perhaps like the camera. We discussed, is it good camera on, camera off? in this mm. remote world. And we said that perhaps for some people, um, it may be easier to have the camera off because as um, I think Carol said, if they, they, they won't mind disclosing to you because they don't, they know you don't know what they look like and you're not, if they cross the street, mm. <laughs> you wouldn't know. Yeah, so maybe that's, there's some, that safety yeah, in anonymity yeah. Yeah. that might, they might feel. But the other thing I was thinking is what could migrant leaders do is perhaps have like a compliance report a, a reporting line an un, anonymous mm. you know reporting line where they could share they could perhaps interact with someone in an anonymous way and then if they wanted to disclose who they are then they could they could mm. then share that if they wanted to get it, if additional help was being yeah. offered that's a really good idea isn't it yeah mm. yeah I think those um are such important important points um and um, some of them certainly reminded me of some of the points that we were we were saying in our group and I think the, what we know from young people is that often they um they don't um they kind of test people out a little bit really before they actually um go ahead and talk about a really big worry they might test somebody out with a little worry or they might say mm, it's my friend or whoever um and and actually just um being aware that the one of the beautiful things about your relationship with as mentors is that there is that opportunity for that relationship to grow and so there is that opportunity for you to be tested by the young person if mm. they feel that that you are um a person who they um who they like and who they would who they think they might feel comfortable with so it's um it's a brilliant thing really it's one of the fantastic things about mentorship it builds that consistency in so thank you so much Yvonne for sharing that um shall I move up the rooms um so the next room is room three I was in that group actually and um Francis kindly agreed to share a little bit about um our discussions Francis would you like to take it away yeah <clears throat> hello everybody um I think it's fair to say that all of us have had some kind of experience in terms of mentoring people either within um, um, the charity we support or other causes or even in our places of work. And it's all relevant to experience. So what, what we discussed amongst ourselves in a time we had is that uh, I think some of this has already been covered. So um, forgive me. Um, it's about building relationships with mentees. Uh, and that takes time. And once you kind of established or built a relationship with them, then the, the mentee will actually open up to you in their own time. Uh, and a, a kind of trust or bond starts to develop. And that's really critical because the mentee could be in a situation where uh, they don't feel comfortable talking about whatever is on their mind with uh, their family. In fact, their families probably are probably the last people they want to talk to about whatever is on their mind because the, the issue actually could relate to uh, their family life. So um, 
it's about building relationships, building trust, which isn't easy and it doesn't happen overnight. Um, it's about being patient. I think that's one of the things we mentioned in our group. Um, not thrusting yourself upon them and not being so quick to come up with solutions. Uh, and it's about investing. It's about taking time to get to know them. And it's about knowing when to push and when not to push. And we talked about this, you know, in terms of what does that mean? Well, it means you can sense that something is wrong and ask questions. And the moment they clam up and say, I don't want to talk about it, um, then you back off and then pick the right moment to come back to that situation again. So it, it takes time. It takes patience. It takes uh, the ability to read people. And it's about investing as well. It's, you know, don't, this is not going to be something you can crack overnight. Don't be so fast or quick to jump into solutions. And, you know, I, for one, work in an environment where I'm, I'm expected to go in, run workshops, come up with solutions and everything else. Um, this is completely different. Uh, you're taking time to get to know somebody, build relationships, get them to open up with open up to in their time, not yours. And it's about investing. And it's also about remembering. And I know this is, uh, might sound like a platitude, but the most important person isn't you, it's the mentee. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Francis. Really, um, I think that there is such a lot of wisdom within the group that I was in um, from Francis and from and from the other two people in the in the group who were oh, quite a small group, but it was um, really, even though it was a very short time, um, very useful things. I think one of the things that just caused me to think about is that actually, um, if you have um, if you have a good heart and you genuinely um, want to um, show that young person that they are valued and that you want to spend time with them, and if you do that in a way that is um, ethically um, a good way, then actually you you can't really go go wrong because even if you make mistakes and sometimes you will make mistakes that is a human thing that shows that you are a human person and that you know you're not a perfect person just like the mentee isn't a perfect person and it's that um that that's the thing about that that human relationship that is taking place within that um very particular space um that is such a unique thing I guess for the for the mentee and where I think we can it's about learning to relax a little bit, isn't it? And not try and be perfect. We do our best, but we don't We don't think we're going to be perfect. And if we're not perfect, just say, you know what, sorry, maybe I just um, pushed a little bit too much there, or maybe I was a bit nosy. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to be. I just wanted, you know, just thinking about you or whatever it is that you need to say. Um, being willing to apologise if you need to. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Okay, we're on to room two. So um, room two was Al, Ben, Bummi, Peter and Usman. So I don't know who in your group um, is the person who um, has uh, said that they'd be willing to share your discussion. We didn't get that far, but I'm happy to talk if the others are happy for me to talk. That would be great. Thank you. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, well, I think we talked about the fact that you need to be in a position of trust with your mentee. So you need to have built your relationship to a point where they trust you and they're able to open up to you. We had a very lively debate about whether it's our place to actually do something with whatever they share with us or whether it's our place to actually um, help, as it were, or advise the young person on how to deal with the situation. I think we came to the conclusion that even if you go to a social worker or whoever you go and report it, that's the fact that that young person has opened up to you and told you what uh, was bothering them, that's the first step that you needed them to take. And they probably wouldn't have said that to anyone else. Uh, we talked about how for a lot of vulnerable young people, uh, most adults in their life have an agenda. So they have something they want from them. And one of our roles as mentors is probably not to have an agenda, but we're, our agenda is just basically helping them. And that helps them to build that trust with you. We also talked about the fact that it's a little bit tricky uh, because you don't want to push too hard uh, because if you do that, person will either close up or get defensive. And at the same time, 
you need to be observant enough to realize when something is wrong and the child or the person is trying to tell you something or may want to tell you something. So you, you need to be observant, but at the same time, you need to hold yourself back uh, and make sure that you don't inadvertently make them close up. Uh, that's everything I remember. I don't know if anybody else in the group wants to just quickly chime in with anything I've missed out. Anybody wanting to add anything? Obviously, I wasn't in the group, so I don't know what else you talked about, but that was a lot of stuff and really, um, really <laughs> important stuff that you shared there with me. So thank you so much for doing that. I, that point about um, the person's experience up to now, the mentee's experience has probably been that adults have had an agenda, I think is such an important thing to remember, isn't it, really? And that actually why? why should they trust you all of a sudden it, that's that's what the point that you were making about the time that is needed really to um to allow trust to um to develop and um and respect to develop isn't it really um it's a thing that 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 all of us working with children we have to earn that respect really from them just a yeah. point on, i think um, for me the bit about the fact that within migrant leaders that the relationship is built around a professional relationship mm. So the fact is you're there and you're talking about all of the their gifts and all of their abilities and all of their potential. So I think you've got such a unique opportunity to focus on, to build up that trust. To, to, you know, that, that for me is what's unique. I think so often people come into relationships or situations with their teachers or parents or siblings or friends and they'll see everything. They'll see all of their sort of you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I think when you're coming in with this, the experience I've had is that what you're seeing is this incredible, these incredible people, these incredible sort of abilities and incredible potential. And so all you're focusing on is their positives. Mm. So you have this amazing ability to build up that trust with them, which I think then leads to being able to have the conversations that um, yeah. we talked about in our in our group. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Really um important reminder about the um yeah that, that as mentors yeah you're working with um with amazing young people and people who will in future help to change our society and be um forces for great good in our society and we have that privilege that great privilege and honor of um of, of working with them as young people amazing yeah thank you yeah um oh gosh the time there's so much to talk about and it's so lovely to talk to 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 you folks about about what you do it's just incredible um yeah room one um can we can we hear from someone in room one about what your um what your learning was and what the the, the points that you were making in your group and what you'd like to share with us is anybody going to be brave enough to volunteer i really don't want to have to pick on somebody <laughs> what room i was in what what room yeah. <laughs> is that uh, catherine you were in you were in room one so i should have yes. said who's in room one room one was catherine richard and well both richards and sammy um <laughs> sammy do you want to do some feedback <laughs> yeah yeah no problem i was waiting to see if we were in one actually so <laughs> um, i think a lot of a lot of what's been said has been some great comments and just uh got over some of what, what we mentioned as well I think just some ads were around trying to build trust as soon as possible it was about that fine line between when do you introduce the fact that if uh, if a um, if a topic comes up where we do have to report it or, or have to state it then when do we introduce that as part of the relationship and uh, Catherine gave some great examples and uh, the role play as to how best to approach that when an individual's about to tell you something to say and said, mm -hmm. go any further, then I will need to you know, um, ask mm -hmm. this further on. And I think what's also important as well is to uh, try and get in the relationship what similarities there might be in terms of and so to understand relationships. Um, so from migrant background, if that's something that we you share with the, with the mentee as well or just hobbies interests etc to try and get on that level uh level playing field and that, that understanding that there might be more than more than you share than you actually realize yeah yeah thank you so much yeah thank you sammy i think um that idea about establishing common ground is a really helpful idea isn't it because it's um it, it then gives you a sort of um 
a kind of um, gives you both, you and the mentee, sort of a little menu of things that feel like safe things to talk about and good things to talk about. And then, and coupled with what Ben was saying about the focus of the relationship being on um, the, the, the mentee's professional development and aspirations and all the gifts that they have to bring. I mean, they're really very, very good and positive and exciting things, isn't it, to sort of factor into a relationship. Most of the time when I've been working with young people, it's about being working with them on all the different problems that they've got and everything. And, and, and then it gets, can get a bit hard work thinking, oh, golly, let's not just talk about the problems all the time. Let's talk about some really great stuff things that's really going well sort of real real their strength and their courage and everything oh there hi there whoever it is who's with Ben yeah so um yeah so that's yeah really very helpful thank you so much all of you for all of that and I wish we had more time to talk um and uh and unfortunately we haven't because we're running out of time and we have a really important section that we Need, still need to cover as much as we can. I will say that um, if we can't cover this last section properly today, then we will make absolutely sure that we come back to it in our follow-up session in February because it, this issue about um, making sure that you are safe as mentors is of absolutely fundamental importance. So we will make sure that even if we don't cover it all today, that we can cover it um, and at the next time and we'll make the space to do that okay so i'm going to share my screen again now thank you very much everyone for that i'm going to share my screen i'm going to um find the right window oh you know what i think i've lost the um no i haven't it's here somewhere here we are got it yeah slideshow from current slide here we are so this is the exercise that we've just done thank you and this is the final section for today which is about um helping you to stay safe as a mentor and um this really is the point where i want to um invite Hosea to talk a little bit about um what migrant leaders offers to you as mentors to help you to stay safe we're talking about your physical health we're talking about your mental health we're talking about um minimizing the risk of of um unsubstantiated allegations um those three areas are the areas that we're covering plus any other questions that you have um but can i invite forja really for you to um to um come in at this point and talk a little bit about about what is um what is available for migrant leaders to to help you be safe in your work Definitely. Thanks very much, Kate. Um, evening, everybody. It's been a real, real, really good opportunity for us all to learn together. Um, I'm just going to focus on a couple of areas of what Migrant Leaders provides you as in terms of resources. So um, you can see the first item there is our mentoring guide and code of conduct, which we put in place as early as possible um, at the start of this process. And that's really your handbook for reference um, in case of there are any issues that you're not sure about. That would be your starting point that I would recommend you go to. And that includes some FAQs and some uh, many little examples of the sorts of situations that you might be dealing with that, that fall into this sort of boundaries and safeguarding area. Um, the things that I would say is that the really the good, it's a good idea for everybody to kind of just be mindful of their environment when they're operating or when they're conducting their mentoring sessions. I think if you're mindful of your environment, um, then that will make you mindful of any safeguarding issues. Um, so one of the things that we definitely recommend is, or in fact we expect, is that your mentoring sessions are remote only, so phone or FaceTime. Um, and then we also recommend that you agree that, you know, the way that you're going to operate with the young person. Um, so not sharing um inappropriate information, that sort of thing on screen, um, not sharing personal details in terms of your personal contact details or even your personal family circumstances and not necessarily expecting, we also tell the young people, you know, don't share your personal details if you don't want to. One of the things I always say to young people is it's up to you to decide what you share and who you share it with. Um, and this touches a little bit on what Frank was saying earlier about um, building up trust and allowing young people 
to share in their own time. Um, and sometimes they, they will refer to something and then quickly move on. And it's about knowing, trying to understand, trying to feel when you can encourage them to expand on that if they want to, but giving them the breathing space to be able to decide whether or not they want to do that at that point, or whether that's something to follow up on or just raise gently with them when you have a chance the next time you speak. Um, we also we put in place DBS checks for our mentors so that um, those mentors that are mentoring young people who are at either in year 12 or year 13, we um, get you to apply for an enhanced DBS check. Um, that's something that we put in place for all mentors that have um, men mentees that are younger than 18. So if they're still 16 and 17 and they're still at college, or if they're a vulnerable young person who's over that age, and we've taken the view that perhaps they will benefit from um, having a mentor with that extra check, um, then we will ask you to consent to us to help, uh, help you apply. And we ask you for some time to send us documents and for us to check those documents so that we can get your DBS check done. It's a very quick process. And Catherine, our colleague who works with us on um, schools liaison as well, um, will lead you gently by the hand through that process and get those checks done. Once, once your bit's done, the DBS checks are really quick and we're always quite surprised that they come back to us within or rather they get sent out within a few days of the applications going in. Um, so it's a really quick, painless process. Um, if you can just give us your time to get those checks done, then we'll be really happy to lead you through that and, and work with you to get those checks done. Um, and the, the other thing I would say is one of the sort of FAQs that we've got in there, which is about, you know, does your mentee want to ask you for a face-to-face -face meeting um, one of the things that we say is please check with us first before you go ahead and arrange that meeting just so that we can talk through the, any issues or implications of doing that and get a feel for um, whether or not that is a good idea for you and for the young person um, when I actually interview all the young people that we take into the program I do mention safeguarding to them so that they're aware that it's an issue that we're concerned with and that it's something that is on the agenda and that they can raise it with us and why, why we put the remote mentoring in place. Um, so I've mentioned our mentoring guide and code of conduct as your main reference guide for general mentoring. If you actually have any safeguarding concerns, then we also have our safeguarding policy. Um, and again, you can get that from our website. I, I actually did send a, a link out to it earlier this week to anybody that was registered for this session. And um, it's also available on our website. And that has the detailed guidance for you on what we expect you to do and what you can expect us to do if there ever is a, a safeguarding concern. Um, and essentially your role is to be aware of it, report it, uh, record it, and then report it to us. And we've got a, a form that we've set up for you to be able to do that and, and send it in to us. Um, so I think that covers everything I wanted to say, Kate. Is there anything else that I haven't covered that you think I need to? Sorry, just unmuting myself. Thank you so much, Fogia. I think it's um, it was very helpful to to hear that and to and for mentors to hear that from from you as well. Um, yeah, certainly when I've been reading the guide and the code of conduct and the procedure, I felt that there is um, an awful lot that migrant leaders um, does. And um, yeah, uh, and and certainly if I were um, a, a mentor, I would I would feel really um confident and comfortable about about doing about about mentoring for migrant leaders i think one of the other things that i find really helpful about what um is contained in the handbook i think is clarity about time commitment because i think otherwise if it's left really open-ended then um it might be easy for people to sort of slip into a more and more and more and more and more time that potentially could start impacting on areas of their of their lives and and um and potentially being um being difficult. And if you and if you do have a young person who who does um 
ideally need a lot of time, then it could be easy to get into that situation, isn't it? But I think the fact that you that you actually are fairly clear that actually you're asking for a minimum of a year's commitment and that really you're thinking in terms of about two to three hours a month. I think that's really helpful thing for mentors that I, certainly if I were a mentor, I would find that really helpful. And when I have volunteered before um, for various different things, I found it really helpful for the organisation to be clear about how much time are they talking about? What level of commitment are they talking about? Um, I think also, yeah, they, the fact, um, I think it was Ben who was really clearly making the point about what the focus of the relationship is. Um, and that's really helpful as well, that, um, that actually the encouragement is to work in a, in, a, in a way that focuses on the young person's gifts, their career aspirations, how the mentoring relationship can help them in that area of their lives. Um, it's not about being a therapist to, to the young person. It's not about, um, about being their best friend at all. It's about, um, it, it has a, it's, a, it's a mentoring relationship that has a particular focus and a particular um, aim to it, really. And that actually, I think, really, really helps to keep it um, to keep it bounded. Um, and I think also the other thing that I think that um, the Migrant Leaders does is, is some opportunities like this, really. Um, um, these networking opportunities and webinars and briefings and, and so on and so forth, opportunities for mentors to come together. I think particularly in these days when it's been so difficult over the last couple of years for us to um, escape some of those feelings of isolation and being on our own, then just being able to touch base just makes some just make you feel so much um, so much better doesn't it really so um I think they're important things too um shall I carry on for you with this section are you happy for me to do that yeah if I could just say if any mentor does ever need to speak to me then I am always going to be able to make time so please do drop us an email and we'll make an appointment to speak um yes but please carry on Kate thanks for yeah okay um I I know that we are um time is, has, has moved on and actually we are now um, just run over time um, but um, I think particularly for people who aren't going to be able to join us for the second session um, I think um, Ellen was um, very much wanting us to make sure that we, we try to cover the programs so we will do that and if people do need to leave well you know that that's fair enough you need to leave but um we would like to try and uh, and get to the end of where we need to get to for today um so we, so let's have a think then about um about what mentors can do in addition to all the things that migrant leaders do which we've heard about from Forgia and that we've been talking about are there additional things that you yourselves can do to take care of your own physical and mental health in your role and you know you are professional people you are um experienced and gifted and intelligent people and you've had to do this <laughs> in all areas of your life for a long time and um i'm sure that you have all sorts of things that you already do um in order to um look after yourselves and in order to um ensure that self-care is in place um but just some some obvious things really um i think the, the the boundaries set by migrant leaders are clear um the point that actually the relationships are conducted online they then that it isn't envisaged that they should be happening in um face to face those kinds of boundaries the um the um code of conduct all those things are are really things that help um you and the mentors the mentees stay safe and are there for that reason really um, I think Forge has already um, indicated that any concerns that you do have you raise them as soon as possible don't wait until something gets to be a huge problem before you raise it I think um, certainly all of us I'm sure that all of you as well in in your other parts of your lives you would um, you would want people to be raising concerns sooner rather than later um, taking time to relax and reflect particularly if yeah, if your mentor's going, if your mentee's going through a tough time, it can be easy to absorb some of those feelings, can't it? And so I guess when you've had a, ment a mentoring session to allow yourself permission to um to relax and and regroup and um and and ensure that uh, that you're that you're back in a good place, really. Um yeah, and and I guess um my dog's about to bark. I'm really sorry. Um yeah, he's, he's barking because at this time of night, he um, is when he gets his playtime. So he's, he's um, starting to let me know. Um, 
And also, obviously, there are going to be sometimes things that happen in your lives that actually um, mean that you need to, to take time away from your role. And, and I think, again, um, everything that I've heard from migrant leaders, from, from Forgia, um, from the underlying values of the organisation and the caring and compassionate values of the organisation, clearly mentors need to do that from time to time. And there might be circumstances that arise that mean that you have to do that perhaps in a way that you weren't expecting. So um, I think all those are things that, um, that, that you would be encouraged to do really. Um, we wanted to um, deal specifically with the issue around unsubstantiated allegations. Um, as you'll have seen from the safeguarding policy, migrant leaders, as all good organisations has, um, has a policy and procedure for handling allegations made against mentors or against any, any member of staff or any volunteer. And, and Migrant Leaders is an organisation committed to safeguarding. And so, of course, allegations are going to be taken seriously and will be followed up. Um, such allegations are, are rare. I mean, I've been, um, I've been a social worker since 1984. So that's a frighteningly long time ago. And I've been in work all that time and worked with a huge number of, um, of children and young people and families. Um, I have never had an allegation made against me. Um, and in all the management roles that I've had, I've only ever known there be two occasions when there has been an allegation made against somebody. That's how, that's how rare it is in my experience. Um, and occasionally, even though the allegations themselves are rare, occasionally those rare allegations are, um, they're groundless, they're based on a misunderstanding, um, or occasionally they can even be malicious. Um, the two occasions when that I was aware of, one was um, a misunderstanding with a little bit of maliciousness um, thrown in there by, um, by uh, an adult, um, and the and the other one was um, uh, basically it was a, an allegation of historical abuse against a member of staff, and the person who made the allegation um, then went back to the police and said he'd made a mistake, and that actually um, it was another person that he'd been thinking about, and um, the the allegations were dropped. So it does happen. There are um, sometimes. Sometimes we say, oh, no, no, that never happens. Um, whatever children say is always absolutely 100% true. Um, in my experience, that that is not the case. They always need to be taken seriously. And most of the time they are true. But occasionally, for various reasons, they might not be true um, for some of the reasons that I pointed out. Um, so I think in terms of, in terms of um, dealing with them, um, the boundaries that set by migrant leaders and the boundaries that are set in the code of conduct will go a long way towards reducing the risk of those allegations happening in the first place. But we know that we know that working with other people, whether it's young people, whether it's anybody, getting involved with human beings inevitably carries an element of risk. We know that 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 one of the very um, special things about being a mentor about working with a young person or an older person at all is, is that you are um, willing to enter into a place where there is an element of risk, however, however carefully that is managed. And that is something that we have to just, if we want to do it, if we want to help, if we want to um, enjoy the wonderful things about working with people, then most of us who do that, I'm sure most of you, otherwise you wouldn't be doing it, feel that the risk is worth it. Um, and there are additional things that mentors can do um, if, um, in, or, in order to reduce this, the, the, the risk of, of allegations being made against them. Um, and you might have your own list of things as well, because as, as we've said throughout this session, um, you know, you, you're, you're people who have experience of, um, lots of experience of, of, of life and of work and of working with people. Um, so you know these things really um, already and probably know others too. So it's trying to avoid behaviour or language or written communication or anything that could be misinterpreted by a mentee. One of the things that um, 
that we always advise people is if you are in a professional relationship with a young person, do not use emojis. Do not use emojis ever because um, the way that you understand them might be different from the way in which the young person understands them, for example. And they may, um, they may land awkwardly or they may be received in a way that you would not anticipate. Um, keep a record of all the sessions so that if someone, if you're asked about what happened in a session, then you can say, this is a record I made of the session at the time, this is what happened. Um, and if anything, there's anything going on that is makes you feel uncomfortable, then talk to the team about it at the earliest opportunity. Don't say, oh my goodness, I need to sort this out. I, I can't talk to anybody about it. Do talk to somebody about it. And that might be that you think the mentee is perhaps becoming over-dependent on you um, emotionally or in any way, or perhaps developing a crush. We know that young people, and older people actually for that matter, but we know that young people um, can, can develop crushes on adults whom they admire and um, whom they come to feel that they have a romantic interest in and may even think that that person might be interested in them as well. Um, we know that that can happen. Um, and if you feel that that's happening, that isn't something that reflects on you. That is about the developmental stage um, and the issues that are going on for, for that young, young person and things can be done to, to, to deal with that situation before it gets, it gets um, uncomfortable for you and uncomfortable for the mentee and, and hurtful for the mentee. Um, and, and also I've known situations and, and and as a manager, I've had people talk to me about finding that they themselves are developing feelings for someone that they're working with that they do not feel are compatible with um, the professional nature of their relationship. And if someone shares that with me, I feel that that is um, um, a, um, an, an act of great trust that someone has shared that with me and that they've been open enough to share that. And that is something that can be dealt with usually by removing the person from that relationship and 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 talking it through with them um, and supporting them with that um, and also feelings can be they might not be positive feelings of any kind that that a mentee in exceptional circumstances may feel towards you there may be a variety of reasons perhaps to do with that mentee's past experiences perhaps to do with um, them having somehow or other developed um, unrealistic expectations of the relationship they may come to to harbor hostile feelings in very exceptional circumstances towards you and if you feel that that is happening um if for example they've asked you to lend them money and you've said no which is obviously what you should be saying <laughs> or to grant them or their family um favors that are not compatible with your role or anything else that that person yeah. might have asked you to do that makes you feel uncomfortable, then, then share that, share that with the program team rather than trying to deal with it yourself. And if in exceptional circumstances, you've ended up doing or saying something um, to the mentee or involving the mentee that is actually a breach of the code of conduct or of the guidance and which you now feel, actually, I shouldn't have done that. Or actually, um, I ended up doing that, but I had to do that because of whatever it was, an exceptional thing that happened that meant that technically you had to breach the code of conduct, then don't keep quiet about it. Don't just sit on it, talk about it, make a record of, of it if it was something that you felt you had to do in the person's best interests. So they are some of the ideas that I had really about um, keeping that risk of, um, of unsubstantiated allegations to a minimum. Um, and I, I don't know, I'd like to, um, invite Forger or anybody or Elam or anybody um, to, to make any comment about any of the things that we've said so far on this topic. I'd just like to say that, um, just to, to reiterate Kate's comments about these sorts of allegations being extremely rare. Um, in all of our time, we've had no issues that have arisen what we do is risk management, um, which everybody will understand about in their professional context. So we try to minimize the risk by putting all these resources in place, by having this discussion, having this briefing with you. Um, so it, 
it can feel daunting, I think, sometimes to talk about these things. Um, but please feel reassured that it's this is all here to prevent these sorts of things coming up. Um, but we will take them seriously if they happen to come up. But thank goodness, touch wood and whatever, all those other little superstitious things that we, we like to hold on to, you know, it hasn't happened so far. And like Kate, I mean, I've worked in the public and, and private sector, um, sorry, the public and charity sector for um, many years, more years than I care to remember. And in my experience, allegations and complaints are rare. Mm. So, um, but it's risk management. Yeah. And I think, I think if I, sorry, Kate, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. sorry Abham, no, you go, you go on. Um, and and I think um, if I may add, um, sometimes I think as mentors, we have to be aware of our own emotional response to situations and such potential allegations as well, because even an adult's emotional response might be to close and not want to share or seek support. So our um, suggestion to our migrant leaders mentors is actually do seek support, do elevate any issues to myself or Fosia, and we will support you, we will help you and guide you. Um, and of course you have our resources and uh, mentors um, guidance, guidance documents as well. So if in doubt, contact myself and uh, Fosia, and we will help you. Thank you, um, Portia and, uh, and Ellen for that. Um, yeah, so um, if there are no more comments about that, if, if people reflect, because this is quite a hard thing to talk about, isn't it? I mean, if people go away and reflect on this and said, oh, I wish I'd asked that, or I wish I'd said something about that, then, um, then, then you know, as I say, we do, we do have our session in, in February when we can pick things up. Um, or if you feel that you need to, or would like to, to raise it straight away, then, um, then I'm sure that um, that the that the, the, the team that that, that Forgio and Catherine would be really um, more than happy to, to to talk to you about any response that you have to um, um, to the, to some of these difficult things that we've been talking about today. But I think the, the overwhelming um, response that that I think that I that in my experience that mentors get from the mentees is. Thank you, thank you for for helping me at this time in my life. Thank you for helping me along um, my life's journey and for helping me towards my aspirations and for giving me that that part of yourself and um and for being willing to um to do that and you know go go that that um that that extra mile with me. I think um that is what that is what the, the overwhelming number of of, of, of mentees will be be thinking so yeah okay so we have just about got to the end of our session um are there any questions or anything else that anybody wants to say in response to any of the things that we have been talking about yeah, we've covered so much material kate I imagine people are still processing and, mm -hmm. and sort of reflecting on their thoughts from this evening session. So um, I don't. I wouldn't be surprised if there aren't too many questions because we've covered so much already. We have indeed, and um, yes, and and we've 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 kept you um, a little bit late as well, really. So um, so apologies for that. But I think it was it was worth allowing the space to um. Oh for questions Absolutely. rather than me just talking all the time yeah okay so just a reminder about what we've covered we've covered lots and lots of things we've covered the legislative context we've covered the types of concern that um can apply to some of the young people that you as migrants can be working with we've talked about issues around blocks and things that get in the way of young people being able to talk about their worries and disclose abuse um, and what we can do to try and be um, doors and not bricks in the wall. We've talked about um, how you as mentors can be can be safe in your mentoring role and the importance of you being safe um, because you yeah that's you, you 
that is your right to be safe and you can't be a good mentor unless you feel safe. So next time we're going to be concentrating on um, signs and indicators of abuse and doing more about that whole thing about picking up on when there could be a concern and what might be indicators of concern and then what to do about it um, and looking at your your own policy and procedure and um, and, and what, what you do if you do have a concern. Um, issues around recording and then we're going to be having a lot more time than we've had today um, with, with you talking and not me um, looking at case scenarios and um, using those case scenarios to really try and unpick and um, and deepen our um, understanding and um, our feelings of confidence to to deal with potential issues that could crop up. Um, and then we're going to be talking about some of the resources that are available, both from within migrant leaders and also outside migrant leaders to help you in your work. And then we're going to have a chance to say goodbye. But in the meantime, we're going to say goodbye now. <laughs> um, and uh, and I'd like to say huge, huge thank you really to um, to all of you today. And a huge thank you to Alam and to Forgia for um, allowing me to spend this time with you today. And I really look forward to seeing as many of you as possible um, for our session in, in February. Um, if you have time, if you can't come to a session in February, and if you um, possibly have time before you go today, even though it's late, I have put in the chat a link to a very short evaluation form. Um, it will take you no more than five minutes to complete and you can link to it directly. So if you have time and aren't coming in February, then it would be brilliant if you could fill that in. If you are coming in February, don't worry about filling it in because we'll fill it in then and it will then cover both sessions. But I know that there are some people who can't make that second session. Um, and I think that's everything from me, I think. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Kate. I should like to thank all our mentors who took so much time out of their schedule on an evening and joined us. A really huge thank you as ever to our volunteer mentors. And thank you, Kate and Fawzia and Catherine, uh, for working on this amazing webinar. And it it's, uh, continues to be amazing working with you guys. Thank you.